Creating a portfolio isn't just about sharing your past work and projects. A compelling design portfolio is about your storytelling ability and how you can capture the attention of potential clients and employers. In this video, we're gonna look at how to create a standout portfolio. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you a simple yet effective trick on how I make my portfolio content stand out and look like it's popping out of the page. Now, before we start, I just wanna clarify that I won't be showing anyone's portfolio in the video itself, including my personal one, because I don't want anyone's information or designs to be permanently embedded into a YouTube video. I will, however, drop a link to my portfolio in the description below and some examples of really good portfolios as well. So make sure you save the video and check them out later. So the first thing to do before you even start creating a portfolio is to prepare your case studies. Your case studies are gonna be the heart of your portfolio. They're gonna illustrate your design process and your problem solving abilities. You wanna choose your most impressive projects and try and gather as much information as possible, such as sketches, wireframes, prototype, uh, user flows and any other supporting documents that you might have. Personally, I recommend preparing up to eight different case studies. You might not end up using all of them, but sometimes when you're putting case studies together, you might think actually the information in this one is not actually that good for a portfolio purpose. So then you end up scrapping that one. And in that scenario, at the very least, you've got some backup case studies that you can fall back on. And if all those case studies are really good and you do want to put them in your portfolio, then great. Uh, you've got a lot of content in your portfolio. Next, let's look at how to structure your case studies. So a really good way that I like to structure them is to use the in media rest structure, which is really commonly used for movies and TV series. This is where you start with the exciting part right at the very start, and then you go back to the beginning and explore how you arrived to the solution. Personally, I think this is the best way of structuring case studies because you give the client a sneak peek of your final designs, which usually should be your most visually pleasing content. And then you go back to the start and explain on all your design processes and go through some of the more technical stuff, like maybe a user flow or style guide. And comparing that to other methods of structuring a case study, where you don't show any of your final designs up front, you're just chronologically constructing a case studies. What ends up happening is the end client, they might not even scroll to the bottom of the page to see your final output. And what they end up seeing is just a bulk of text and loads of scribbly lines, which might not put out a great first impression. And you can check out an example of this structure in my portfolio. So in practice, it will look something like this. You want a large, beautiful hero banner of your final product right at the top. Then you have a project name. There may be two lines for project overviews. Then I like to add in some statistics to grab the user's attention here. So it can either be your end result. So maybe something like 80% conversion rate, 4.3 stars in the App Store, 2.3 million daily users. Or if your app hasn't been launched yet, then what you can do is list some statistics that helps define the use case. So for example, if we're gonna be talking about accessibilities, you can say 8% of the population has colorblindness. After that, I like to list the design tools I used. So the reason why I do this is because a lot of the times it's actually gonna be the resourcing team or recruiters who are gonna be looking at your portfolio. And a lot of the times, even though we know that if you're good in Figma, you can probably use Sketch or Photoshop or Illustrator, but a non-technical recruiter might not know that. So if they are very specifically looking for, say, Figma or Jira or GitHub, and you've listed them in your portfolio, then that's really useful for people who might not technically know what they're looking for. And then once I've done those, I will start from the very beginning of the case study and I'll keep each of the paragraphs very, very minimalistic. So literally just one or two lines explaining what you're doing and then an image to support that paragraph and then you keep going until you get to the end of the case studies. Now, a really common issue that I find is that a lot of people write way too much information and turn it into a 10,000 words dissertation. And what you need to factor in is most people will only glance at your portfolio for 10 to 20 seconds before they decide whether or not they wanna carry on reading. And even if they do decide to read your whole portfolio, they're not gonna read every single word of it. So make sure your script is really concise in order to them to fully understand the project and decide whether or not they wanna continue reading. Okay, once you've done those steps and you've got your case studies ready, we can start looking at exploring the landing page of your portfolio. Now think of your portfolio as the front store of you as a personal brand. You want it to be simple, visually pleasing, and easy to navigate. 
I would personally recommend sticking with black and white and then just using one different color if you do want to add a bit of color to your design. And the reason for this is because in your case study, you're going to have loads of different colors appearing, especially if you've worked with different clients, they're going to have different style guides and all of them are going to be appearing on your portfolio page. And if you start adding loads of different colors to your portfolio, this can end up creating a more chaotic design in the user experience of your portfolio, which obviously isn't great if you're applying to be a user experience designer. And in terms of number of pages, I like to just use the home page as the main portfolio page because you want your portfolio to be easy to navigate and concise. As soon as someone lands on your page, all they have to do is scroll down a little bit to get to the bulk of the content. And then you have a second page for about me. This is where you write a brief description of yourself, uh, what kind of qualifications you've got, and maybe any accomplishments that you've achieved. And I think it's also good to list out the skill sets that you can use as well. And in terms of picture, that is subjective, whether or not you want to include a picture of yourself. And if you want to link your Instagram, you can do that as well, but obviously make sure it's professional. Alternatively, you can link it to LinkedIn or other professional platforms where you've done a bit of work on, such as Behance or Dribbble. For the layout of the main portfolio page, you can go with the 222 structure. I think anything above this is a bit too much. So if you've got three three threes or four four fours, you end up with too much clutter on the page. And also you're gonna need a lot of case studies to fill out all of them. And if you want to, you can add a bit of text below each of the thumbnail as well. But because it's a visual project, I personally like to rely on creating good aesthetics to make the client want to click on the project itself. Alternatively, you can just use the vertical stacking list as well. So you're just listing one project at a time and you can structure it so it's left, right, left, right, or centered, or left or all right, whichever alignment you think is best. Personally, I don't like this method as much because it creates a lot of white space on the page, but I know many people who have great portfolios use this method. Next, let's talk about structuring your portfolio strategically. You always want to put your best work at the top. There's been time where I've seen people list projects out in chronological order. I don't think this leaves a good first impression because if you imagine scrolling through a website and naturally your oldest work is probably your weakest work, you don't really want to showcase your weakest content first to your potential clients. You want to show the most relevant work and the best work that you've produced that's the first thing that client sees when they go onto your portfolio. And if you have any old projects that you don't think are good anymore, take them out. Because a lot of people think, oh, I need to bulk up my portfolio because I've only got four projects on there. But actually having bad case studies is more detrimental to your portfolio. Because if you have any bad work in your portfolio, that will leave a bigger impression than the good ones. And lastly, you want to create consistent images and thumbnails to tie everything together. What you don't want to be doing is for someone to be reading one of your case studies and the images are really small on one part and the next part you've got a massive 4K image and then as you scroll further down, you've got another image that's different size as well. An easy way you can get around this is to import all your images into Figma. Then in Figma, create a frame that you know will fit into your portfolio and then start positioning the assets within that frame. Once you're happy with the position of these, export that as a new image. Continue doing this process with all the different assets that you've got for your case studies. And what you get in the end is all your images will now be the exact same dimensions to give a consistent look throughout the portfolio. So let's look at a technique that I think anyone can use to start making the objects of their portfolio looks like it's popping out of the screen. Okay, so we're in Figma now, and what I've got on the screen here are two designs that I've taken from the Apple Design Resource. And let's just assume these are my designs for my portfolio. And what most people would do in this instance is they will take the images and put it into the thumbnail area and maybe just position it like this and say Apple Home Screen Design bigger and bold. So if I was to add in the Microsoft Teams design from the Microsoft Team UI kit as well, and you know, it's not terrible. The visual layout is okay. And what I like to do is to customize the thumbnail so it looks like it's popping out of the page. And the first thing we need to do is to outline the frames itself. Right now I've actually framed any of the elements on the page. So I'm just gonna do that first. So if I do frame selection on these, 
and then I've selected these three and I do a frame selection as well. And now I'm just going to rename it so it's easier for me. Um, I'm going to call this iPhone and then this will be Teams. Now what I can do is actually just reduce the size of the background layer to something like that. And the height has now been reduced to 280. And I can do the same with the Teams image as well. So reduce that to 280 and then make this a little bit bigger. Now instantly you can see that it just looks like it's popping out of the page a little bit because it's got a little bit more of an overlap within the thumbnail design. It just adds a little bit more character and visually it just looks like it's been thought about a little bit more on the portfolio side. And if I was to drag the iPhone frame out of the portfolio page, it's already factored in the transparent pixel into the image so that if I was to export it and use it for my portfolio on Squarespace, the image itself won't have a background to the transparent layer. So it doesn't matter if you end up changing the background of your portfolio or if you enable light mode, dark mode, the transparent layer will not show in the portfolio itself. Okay, so what else can we do to these images to make it look even better? So I like to use something called Clay Mockup as a Figma plugin. You can download that from the Figma community store. And what that does is basically a modal will come up. And I've prepared the frame without the iPhone bezel. And if I select an image, it will create a 3D mockup where I can spin it around. Clay Mockup will actually create an export of these images. So let's say I want one that is at this angle. And I'll do save as image. So create this image for me. And then if I do clay markup again, and now I've got the other image selected here and click save as image. Now I've got two images that I can use in my thumbnail. So I'm just gonna crop these a little bit so it's easier for me to use. Okay, so now let's drag these into my thumbnail frame. So let's remove these two original images and let's decrease the size of them more. And then now I'll paste them into here. And for the time being, I'm just going to put a stroke around the iPhone frame so I can see what the outer edge would be. So now what you can see is it just instantly adds a little bit of depth to the thumbnails in your portfolio. And I will do the same to the team's image as well. So let's put it out and go to clay mockup. So you can actually change the device. So let's do a MacBook. So you can press shift to pan it around. If you just click and drag, it's rotational, and then obviously you can zoom in and zoom out. So I think that's good to so save this image. Now let's shrink this down a little bit more. Drag this back into the Teams frame. So I actually don't really like the white MacBook. I do want to change it, so I'm just going to remove that again. And then click on the Teams again, go back to Plugin, Clay Markup 3D. And for the device color down here, you can actually change it. So I'm just going to go with 333 and let's change it back to MacBook again. Let's save that image again, shrink it down. So the only thing you got to make sure for the clay 3D mockup is you want to make sure the image fits within the frame of what you're going to export. So it doesn't matter if the MacBook image itself exceeds the frame of the team's frame. Uh, because in the export, it's not going to show the transparent layer of the MacBook image. So it's okay for it to be outside of the team's frame. So as you can see, within a really short amount of time, I managed to create something that makes the images pop out a lot more onto the page uh, just with these simple tricks. And you can apply this to your portfolio, obviously spend a little bit more time to think about the positioning of things. Uh, you might not want to position it in the middle and it may be that you want to add a few more content onto the page as well. It doesn't have to be a 3D mockup of the screens. It could even be, you know, the logo of the company that you're working with. So hopefully you found that useful. And if you want to learn how to start your own design agency, you can click on this video here. We'll go through details of how I started my design agency 10 years ago and how I managed to find clients that are still with me now. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.